Welcome to our channel, Behind My Story. Please, like, share, and subscribe. Our feelings are always hard to control. We are humans, after all. Sometimes we do things we can't explain, just because we feel that way. I had a student named Daniel, a sweet and innocent child. I was prepared to do anything for him, but don't judge me just yet. First, let me tell you my story. My name is Jolene. I'm a 21-year-old math teacher at a primary school. I live with my sister and my mother. My house was next to the school where I work. I love teaching, and I like teaching the students in creative ways. They loved me, and I loved them. Daniel was a special student, though. Our story began at the start of the new year. It was the first day of school. I missed all my students over the summer break. I missed them so much that I stood by the door to welcome them back. Before I started my first lesson, Mr. Smith, the student affairs officer, knocked on the class door, with Daniel hiding behind his back. Mr. Smith greeted the class and asked them to greet Daniel, but Daniel was too shy and didn't move. So I went over to him to take him by the hand, but he pulled his hand away, which embarrassed Mr. Smith. I asked him to greet his classmates, so he went and he stood in front of the class and he said, Hello, I am Daniel. Then he went and he sat at the very back of the class. He didn't talk much with the other kids. He didn't like to interact with anyone. Daniel always looked sad, and I thought to myself, he's only eight. What could possibly have made him that way? I tried to get close to him, but he resisted all my efforts. Sometimes he looked like he was hiding some big secret. And later on, I learned what it was. One night, when I was surfing the social media, I came across a horrible news story about a jealous husband killing his wife and another man right in front of his son. The child had been none other than my new student, Daniel. Reading that sad story, I started understanding why Daniel was acting that way. I decided to try brightening his life a little. Every day, I would buy a small present and put it on his desk. At first, it had no effect, but slowly he came to love that. During break time, I would sit beside him and we would share food together. I would get him involved in class activities. On his birthday, I arranged a surprise party with his class, his grandmother, and myself. He was so happy that day. After the party, he hugged me and he told me that he loved me. I hugged him tightly. He was not just a student to me. I treated him like he was my own son. He told me that he wanted to call me mother, and that made me so happy. After his grandmother died, he came to live with me. We faced a lot of problems together, but I followed his success in life with pride. Daniel is all grown up now. He's graduating from the Faculty of Engineering. I am so proud of what he has made of himself. End of the world scenarios are presented in a lot of Hollywood movies, zombie apocalypses, alien invasions, meteor collisions, monstrous solar flares, premature ice ages, and worldwide deadly virus outbreaks. The last one is the one I used to imagine a deadly viral outbreak that spread all over the world and wiped out humankind. My name is Rita, and I'm 21 years old. And as you can see from my introductory paragraph, I have an active imagination. I'm in my senior year at med school, on my way to becoming a doctor. My parents died in a car accident, which left me responsible for raising my younger brother. Our aunts and uncles lived in another city, so they couldn't really help us much. It was up to me to nurture good habits in him, regarding food, health, and education. I had to find work after my parents died, so I got a job at the hospital, where all the doctors predicted that I would have a bright future ahead of me. One day, the hospital director called me into his office and told me that I had won a scholarship to study and work in China. I was so happy. I'll get to work and study abroad in a foreign culture, but that meant that my brother would have to come along. So, we went to China and we got an apartment near the hospital I was supposed to work. China was a beautiful country. All the people worked diligently. The area I was in was exceptionally clean, and all our neighbors were very kind. China was one of the most powerful industrial countries in the world. The only obstacle I faced there was finding suitable food to eat. The Chinese people ate practically anything that moved. Dogs, cats, snakes, scorpions. Ugh, disgusting. But when I heard that they ate bats, I threw up all night. During my studies, I knew that China had a lot of rare illnesses, but I never imagined that I would encounter any while I was there. One day, our hospital received a case with strange symptoms. 
After many diagnostic tests, we still couldn't figure out what the affliction was. The patient had a fever and a very bad cough. His respiratory system was in severe distress, so we put him in the intensive care. Shortly after, we began receiving an influx of patients with the same symptoms, a red flag that an epidemic was probably already on the way. And my brother and I were right in the middle of it. What a nightmare. Soon afterwards, my brother fell ill. That's where I drew the line. If an apocalypse was coming, I wasn't quite ready for it yet. So we left China and returned home. Thousands of people died in China due to that rare disease. But thankfully, my brother recovered fully and is now okay. As for me, I shifted my studies to seeking out a cure for this new coronavirus that broke out in China. Have you ever dreamed of having some shocking surprise completely change your life? Whether this surprise is good or bad, your life will never be the same again. I have a story to tell you about this very thing. My name is Tiffany, and I'm 21 years old. I live with my parents and an occasional mystery guest, whose role in our lives I have yet to ascertain. I would see him from time to time. I assumed that he was some down-on-his-luck guy whom Dad helped once. Dad was wealthy and often donated money to help the poor. This mystery man would try to talk to me whenever he would spend a few days with us. I didn't understand why Dad allowed him to stay at our home sometimes. It was bizarre, and it did creep me out a little. There was one time when he opened the door to my room while I was sleeping. He sat on the bed next to me for a while and then left. I was half awake at the time, but I didn't move. When I told my parents about this, they said they would speak with him, but I'm not sure they ever did. I felt uneasy about the situation, so I decided to investigate this matter myself. I had to figure out who this mystery man was, and why he stayed with us periodically. One day, Mom wasn't feeling well, and Dad drove her to the doctor's office to be checked out, leaving me home alone. I sneaked into the office to have a look around, see if I could find something about this strange man. While I was searching, I heard a voice behind me. I thought it was my parents, but it was the mystery man. He was smiling at me. It made me feel awkward. He said hi. I stepped back and said, If you take one step closer, I'll scream. He said, Calm down. You're suffering from an illness, and I need you to fight it for me and for your parents. What are you talking about? I feel fine, I said. He said, You don't recognize me. I'm your husband. Shocked, I grabbed the phone to call the police. But he stopped me. Don't do that. I won't hurt you. But I won't leave either. I started screaming loudly. Just at that time, my parents returned and entered the study. I shouted for them to help me. Dad came over and hugged me. Then I felt a needle prick the back of my neck. And I lost consciousness. I woke up in a hospital bed with my parents and my so-called husband beside me. I asked them what was going on. They told me that I must have been dreaming, that I had just woken up from a week-long coma, induced by a rare type of brain disease that damaged my long-term memory. My husband hugged me and told me that he loved me, if only I knew who he was. My name is Jerry. I am the village dreamer who touched the poor suffering in pain. In my country, illness is a monster that eats its victim's soul without mercy. I decided to be the soul saver, or the savior, of souls. Heroes in my country don't wear superhero costumes. Rather, they wear white lab coats with stethoscopes hanging around their necks. I knew how difficult it was to become a doctor, but I was up for the challenge, so I enrolled in a medical college. The studies were challenging, but my creed in life is this. An opportunity may only come around once. You must take it or leave it. After graduation, I was hired to work in a government hospital in my village. Unfortunately, I discovered early on that my knowledge level wasn't broad enough, so I traveled to England to expand my knowledge base. I wanted to take advantage of the experience of the professional doctors there, so I attended difficult surgeries and observed and studied them intently. My mind was like a sponge, absorbing vast amounts of empirical data. Even so, I still wasn't satisfied with my knowledge level, so I traveled to the USA. When I arrived in Chicago, I felt like a thirsty man who had an oasis in the desert. 
I encountered advanced technologies, modern, new, medical equipment, leading-edge ways of treating heart disease, serious heart disease cases, and fantastic anecdotal stories from famous doctors about their most unusual cases. I dreamed of being a great doctor like them, and my opportunity came when a baby girl was diagnosed with a serious heart illness. She was not expected to live long, so I volunteered to perform some risky surgery on her. All the doctors around me thought I was crazy, but I knew that I could do it. After five hours of arduous concentration, focus, stress, and sweating under the operating room lamps, the surgery concluded successfully. I had proven myself to be a great doctor after all. Afterwards and subsequent surgeries, I became known as the guardian angel who saved souls. I gathered a huge following due to my successes. I was surprised when my surgery techniques later became required studies in my country. I became a role model for many aspiring medical students. I returned home to thank my country by building a heart hospital that treated people for free. Many people donated to my cause. My hospital saved many souls, but this is a never-ending mission. My country bestowed upon me the honorable title of the Prince of Hearts. Will you donate to my cause? My son killed me. Yes, you read that correctly. I am not a ghost or an evil spirit that needs rescuing. I have a brave heart. My name is Megan, and I hope to inspire you with my story. I lived with my father and my sister Marlene after the death of my mother, who died from an illness. Though I was only 18 years old, I became responsible for taking care of my whole family. I did everything for them, like cooking, cleaning, washing, etc. My father was a great man, and he did his best to make us happy. I supported both my sister and my father. We faced a lot of problems together, illnesses, financial problems, school, and the like. But there came a day when I had to make a life-and-death decision at my young, tender age. I fell in love, as any girl my age tends to do. My sweetheart turned out to be loved my neighbor, a guy named Dave. We had grown up together, and we shared everything. Love, sadness, jokes. Our dreams had evolved as we grew up, too. So we decided to marry. He knew all about my life circumstances. So he chose a flat near my family for me. We had a nice party and celebrated with our families and friends. Every day, he proved himself to be a responsible man. He loved and respected me, and I him. Finishing my studies was one of my dreams, and Dave supported me in every way to achieve it. But my biggest dream was to have a baby. But sometimes, life just isn't fair. One day, while cleaning the house, my heart began beating rapidly, and I couldn't breathe well. I was barely able to call out to Dave, who came immediately when he heard me cry for help. I had had this symptom before when I was younger, but I never told my father because I didn't want to worry him. Dave took me to the hospital, where a doctor said I had a serious heart condition. And not only that, I was pregnant too. Pregnancy and a heart condition do not a good combination make. So we had to choose between the baby's life or mine. My father and Dave asked me to abort the baby, though they tried hard to persuade me. I resolutely refused. I agonized a lot during my pregnancy. My father and Dave were so worried for my safety. My father and Marlene left their flat to live with me. In addition, Dave cut back on his working hours to stay with me. The day came when I went into labor. They took me to the hospital, where the doctor checked me over and pronounced that my condition was so serious that I wouldn't be able to survive the childbirth. My family and I were shocked. I held Dave's hand and told him that I was strong enough to survive this. Dave hugged me, crying tears like a river. I was so afraid, but I did my best to hide that fact. I looked to my protruding belly and said to my baby, I want you to know that I sacrificed myself for you. You had better grow up to be a great young man. I love you. Then the baby started pushing its way into this world. The scene fades to blackness. The baby is born. Suddenly, a year later, a birthday party is being held. The baby is now one year old. A woman is singing with the baby and her family. The woman looks at you and winks. Megan says, Ha ha, fooled you. I lived through the childbirth. Sometimes life gives us a second chance. But you have to be willing to accept the risk. Hi there. 
I'm Carl and I'm 19 years old. I live with my grandpa on his farm on the outskirts of the city. Grandpa is fond of nature and quietude, as these calm his soul and spirit. He loves cultivating flowers and is very skilled in this field. He reads numerous books on unusual species of flowers, including their planting and growing requirements. He can also extract perfume fragrances from flowers. At first, I didn't care about this hobby of his and viewed it as a waste of time. However, after talking with him many times at length and listening to his myriad descriptions of the beauty of nature and flowers, I became hooked on them myself. Now I am as passionate as he is about them, and I love to study and learn about exotic and rare flowers. One of Grandpa's friends happened to be a botanist. He could talk for hours about rare flowers, even imaginary ones depicted in science fiction movies. One evening after he had visited our home and left, we went into the kitchen to prepare dinner, when suddenly there came a knock at our front door. I answered the door but no one was there, nothing save a small box with a card, which I dutifully carried to Grandpa. The card said simply, a gift from a dear friend. So we opened the box to find some strange seeds that were unlike any that Grandpa had ever seen before. He read another part of the note. This is a Yasni flower from the future. Get ready for a fantastical, unforgettable trip. We didn't really believe this silly message, but we decided, what the heck, let's plant them and see what happens. In just three days, the seeds had produced exotic-looking purple flowers. Grandpa plucked one to extract some perfume from it. It had a wonderfully fragrant smell. Suddenly, I felt enervated and listless. My vision blurred, I couldn't breathe, and I became dizzy and passed out. When I opened my eyes, I was in the middle of some unknown desert. There were unfamiliar-looking parked cars with people in unfamiliar-looking clothes. One of the strangers pointed at me in alarm and shouted, Catch him! I ran, but they surrounded me and caught me. They bound my hands and hung me from a horizontal tent frame. I heard a groan and looked to my left to see Grandpa, similarly bound and hanging from another tent frame. The strangers were speaking in a language I had never heard before. Their apparent leader came over to us and said, See this desert? The entire world is like this. Because of you. You destroyed our world. Our future is dark and bleak now. Those Yasni flowers you planted ended up breeding out of control and destroyed the world. You need to pay for your foul deeds. Suddenly, I heard a gunshot. Someone had shot Grandpa in the chest. He was bleeding profusely and appeared to be unconscious or dead. I couldn't tell which. I screamed and then the shooter came towards me with hatred blazing in his eyes. He stopped and placed his gun barrel to my forehead. I screamed no and closed my eyes tightly. After a pause and hearing no shot, I opened my eyes to find myself lying on the floor beside Grandpa, the plucked flower lying between us. I woke him up and told him about my dream and found that he had had the exact same dream. He called his botanist friend and described the seeds, the flower, and its fragrance to him. The botanist said the unknown flower sounded similar to one that grew high in the Swiss Alps. It was illegal to import because it was known to induce hallucinations and cause other unpredictable reactions in people. To this day, we have no idea who the dear friend was that sent us these unusual hallucinogenic flowers. We figure it must have been someone's idea of a practical joke. Or were these Yasni flowers indeed sent to us from the future? I adore my family. I adore our get-togethers, our joking around, our meals, everything. I can't imagine my life without them. But one day, I almost killed them all. No, I'm not insane, I assure you, so don't worry, I'll tell you what happened. My name is Ginger, I'm 18 years old. As you can see, I'm wearing an apron. This is because I love to cook. I like all things kitchen related. My happiest moments are when I see my family eating a meal together. I always cook for them. They enjoy it too. And they support me. They let me try different dishes from different countries. I like to listen to their opinions about my cooking skills. I'm also addicted to cooking programs. One day, my cousin Charlotte came to visit, before Thanksgiving Day. She likes to dress all in black, and today was no exception. For some reason, she had called me earlier and asked me if I had ever heard of Thanksgiving Day curse. I said no, of course. So she told me that the curse applied to large families, who ate a big meal together on Thanksgiving. The curse was the result of an evil spirit named Vicky, who would possess the cook's body in some family's household and poison the whole family. She said that Vicky used to be a housewife who was a great cook and who loved her family, and yet she poisoned them all during Thanksgiving meal. She watched them die one by one, and then she killed herself as the grand finale. 
At first, I thought Charlotte was joking and trying to scare me, and I told her that it was nonsense, just an old wife's tale, but she said that every legend was usually based on facts. I paused for a second. That was partly true. I went to my room and searched the internet, and found the same information about the curse that she had relayed to me, which frightened me even more. Vicky was just like me, or was it the opposite? I stopped myself from getting deeper into this. I needed to focus on preparing the meal. On Thanksgiving's day, my father bought some groceries, which included a white bottle of liquid. I presumed it to be milk, though it smelled a little weird, but I thought it was my imagination. My aunt called and said she would be arriving a few minutes later, so I had to hurry and finish the meal quickly. My finishing touch was dessert. It was going to be pumpkin candy. I prepared it using the milk that Dad bought. After everyone had arrived, I served dinner. We all sat down and prayed before the meal. Then, everyone started eating. Things were going well. Everyone was chatting merrily and complimenting me on the food. I was overjoyed. But somehow, I couldn't shake this feeling that something was wrong. I looked at Charlotte, but she smiled supportively. Suddenly, one by one, the people around the table started clutching their stomachs and groaning in pain. The last thing I remember before I lost consciousness was my brother calling the ambulance. When I woke up later, I was lying in a hospital bed, alongside all my family members, who were also lying in the hospital bed. The doctor came in and reported happily that we would all be fine. Then he looked at me and winked. He also said, Next time, young lady, I suggest not using white paint in your cooking. And that was how I almost killed my loving family.